Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this week, we're having a nice chat with C.L. Clark, the author of The Unbroken. Welcome. Thank you so um, much. My first question is, why do you use so much uh, French sounding names in the naming of your novel and some words too i know this uh i guess it's part, partly just to make sure that i'm reflecting the origin of my my main inspiration which was um in college i studied french very heavily i, I was a french finer and It's at some point in my teaching, I was in a Francophone African literature class. And so I actually learned about Franco colonial um, Africa, North Africa in particular. Um, and I was like, oh, hmm. Fantasy does not reflect real world war, real world, real world conquering. I would really like to do that. And So the, many places have been colonized and by many different people, I, my actual specialty, um, specialty area um, that I studied and really knew a lot about was um, France and North Africa. So, How long did it take you from writing the first draft to actually publishing the book? And then did the story actually change over that time period? Almost 10 years. Um, <laughs> And it did change a lot, but I think the core of it was the same. It just took me a long time to figure out what I really wanted to say. And part of that core that I couldn't get to um, was because I wanted to tell earlier on a sort of happier bodyguard royal type romance. And the more I learned about my actual setting, the more I learned about history and the more I just I dealt with the world, the less I wanted to gloss over. Um, and the more I wanted to hold true with my original idea, which was to let a fantasy empire actually reflect the real world empires. And so a happy-go-lucky, very romantic bodyguard and royal relationship just wouldn't work out, um, at least not without significant conflict, um, but also a conflict of interest between the characters. And so uh, it changed a lot. It changed a lot in between drafts. I think there were like six full rewrites um, between first draft and um, final publication. Your blurb on Amazon, and I quote, Uh, start with a perfect military fantasy. Why military fantasy in your description rather than uh, actually just a, a, a conquest? It's a, it's a brutal, ugly, colonial history. Why focus on the military aspect rather than the basically enslavement? I mean, I think one way to look at it is just that um, a lot of, colonization was driven partly by the military, at least at first. Um, and there are other elements of the colonial in um, The Unbroken, but it's not, it's not as prevalent as, say, a book like A Memory Called Empire, where there isn't really any military colonization present at all. It's just all like the sort of insidious cultural perfection of the empire Uh, that makes the 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 colonies feel more like they're supposed to be inferior. And so there's some of that in The Unbroken, but I think marketing also, just because um, of different intersections of readers, wanted to kind of loop in everybody. Like, let's get the people who like, like Joe Abercrombie in here, and let's get like something like that as well. So much of the book is about choice and consequence right so when you wrote the book were you trying to convey a message to the readers i mean probably i feel like most books though i don't think any more than um any other book that you know people make choices um and they have impacts on others and 
I mean, maybe I'm interested in people thinking more about the kinds of impacts that their choices have on each other, especially because our world is still very much a colonial world, though people try to say that these things are over. So-and-so has independence now. So maybe, maybe like that. But I think that's more up to the reader what kind of, what they take from it in that sense. Is it frightening to write uh, this military fantasy, which is deeply ingrained in uh, racism? Did you felt like you weren't going far enough or too far to keep all of the audience? Did Was it difficult to draw everything that you wanted to write and think you sh thought the readership was not ready to read about? Well, I mean, I've seen enough reviews to know that I certainly went too far for many of them. Um, <laughs> and actually, I actually have gotten some very interesting, um, not things I was like looking for, but, you know, you see people talk about them on the Internet because they don't realize that, like, anybody can see anything on Twitter um, just because one random mutual liked something. And so then they see, oh, well, this is what you thought of my book. And so... Um, I've seen people be like, uh, um, you, this, I don't trust this reader or this writer because um, they think that only Europe colonized places. And I'm like, well, I mean, sure, other empires did. Like, sure, Alexander the Great had a, a very large empire, actually, yeah. But we're not still dealing with the after effects of his golden age, whatever. Um, and the only non-white major imperial power whose effects we might still be seeing um, would be like, you know, I mean, look at the Ottoman Empire and the Armenians, for example. Like, that's something we still see the effects of. But then we get to the other part. That's not my specialty. I'm not going to write a book about the Ottoman Empire because I, I don't know about the Ottoman Empire. And so there's stuff like that. And I'm like, you are just looking for a reason to not read this book. So, bye. Um, so there are definitely people who I think I went too far for, um, or just the existence is too far. But I think that um, the harder part, honestly, has to do with dealing with the romance aspect. Like, I think um, people who, people might have wanted me to go harder and not let them be even remotely romantically involved. Um, and some people might have been like, well, this romance is terrible. They're supposed to be kissing, and all they're doing is being mad at each other. And so I think, I think there's a little bit of both on both sides. Um, so that part was definitely, definitely pretty. I mean, and the second book, writing it with the second book is also pretty challenging. Uh, we'll see how many kisses happen. <laughs> Would you wish you gone farther again, go deeper, and just uh, say f <laughs> and let just be real? <laughs> I don't know why. You know, I honestly, I don't know. Like, I mean, I I know I'm very happy with where I left it in the Unbroken. Like, I'm glad they are not getting like some great happy ending. I'm glad there was no magical consummation um, because I tried writing those kinds of scenes, but the issue became that those, like a sex scene, for example, between these two with the kind of power differential that they have for most of the first book is only like barely barely it could be cons considered consensual and that's not really how I wanted them to start a relationship oh, even, even if it's just temporary um and so I cut them I cut I cut them out um eventually because it just it wasn't working and I wanted at least for now like if they do something I want it to be something that's kind of good at least um and it can be difficult and they can have to work through it but I didn't want it to start with that kind of like dubious consensual kind of thing thank you so i have a slightly cheeky question because you've planned the series as a trilogy mm -hmm. do you know how it's going to end 
sort of, <laughs> maybe. I, I have written what I think is, at least right now, it is the last scene between uh, Luke and Terrain. And that's oh, it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long it will, like, if it will stay that. I told my editor kind of what I'm envisioning and... Or I told her it existed, and she said she didn't want to know it. So it's just it's just mine right now, and it's subject to change. But has your writing style changed over the book? So are you, do you outline your plot for each book? The first one, and this is probably why I had so many drafts of it. The first one, I pants the very first draft, um, and then I had to learn how to revise because it was the first book that I really did serious revision on. So that was really hard. <laughs> and, but part of that process was outlining what I wanted to make out of what I had already written so I could see what would stay and what would be poured over. And um, in that process, I became an outliner because I was like, surely if I outline first, it will not be this much hell again. And sort of, that's true. Um, I also have less time to write. Like I, I had a lot of time to rewrite those novels and I have like a year and a half turnaround for this. So a bit more pressure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you said the unbroken took, uh, about 10 years to be ready mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be a trilogy. You won't pull, a. Uh, Uh, something like, uh, what's his name, R.R. Uh, Martin, or <laughs> um, No, because unlike George R.R. Martin, I actually need the money. So, <laughs> so I'm going to get my books in and get them on time. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still really enjoying the story as well. So, you know, I would like, I would, I would like to finish it for me. Um, and, you know. It shouldn't be later than 2024, just depending on how, like, actual printer schedules go. Like, the last book is scheduled to be out in 2023. Hopefully for all of us, because like, I'm excited to write it, but I also want to, you know, I want to be done and move on to other, other projects as well. So hopefully we will all have what we want in 2023. Durin and Luca are quite intense characters, So do you, is that something you enjoy doing, writing like emotionally complex characters? Oh, absolutely. I think I would just be bored out of my mind otherwise. Um, it's difficult to track them. I definitely have had to like, wait, how do they feel in this scene? How do they feel in this scene? There have been times when like I completely forgot that something happened in a previous chapter and then they were like totally happy and chilling. And I was like, well, no, somebody's dead and they can't be happy in this scene and, and stuff like that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are things I've forgotten. There's a lot of, a lot of books there. So please forgive me if someone is smiling too much after a murder in all future books. When did you first get in contact with the writing wanting to write? Oh, when I was very little, very, very little. Um, my mom writes, and she wrote a lot when I was a kid, uh, mostly poetry, but she'd also write us little, like, I don't know, little, like, moralistic stories. Like, she wrote this story called Gimme Kimmy um, that was about this girl who didn't have manners and would never say please and was just always telling people to give me, give me, give me. Um, and it was very good. And there was like a whole cast of characters. So there was one for somebody who didn't want to take a bath, one for somebody who wouldn't share, who wouldn't eat her vegetables, like a whole range of children I was supposed to not be like. Um, and, but also I, I, I think from a young age, I really wanted to um, just be somewhere else. And so the two things I wanted was acting and writing. And so if I acted, I could put on a costume and swing a sword or whatever. Or if I wrote the stories, then I could swing a sword in the head and live out my little fantasies that way. So, yeah, I think, I don't know. The first real story that I wrote, um, actually, which you all can listen to, um, I, can even send you, I can send you guys a link later to stick with it. But there is, it, this week aired a um, the ephemera reading series. They have a two or three minute snippet of me reading a little bit of my juvenilia and it is my first real short story that I um 
like I wrote it in the kind of fantasy vein of very heavily inspired by Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Um, you can you'll probably hear it as you as you listen to it. Um, and that I wrote when I was like 13 and then revised it once when I realized I was gay. What kind of research went into writing The Unbroken? Because there's a lot of history in the book. Well, part of it came from just the research I did in in school, like in my post-colonial literature classes. So at a certain, a certain point when I was writing, it was just something that was already internalized in me as an academic. Um, but I, I also did, I did learn Arabic and um, went to Morocco and I went to... Um, Paris to go to actual libraries and actual sites and stuff like that, um, and other other countries with colonial histories. Um, I, I was in India, and so I did some um, more, more visual research in in some senses, like um, looking at like Mughal Empire sites and stuff like that. Um, but also the over impression of Britain on India of France on Vietnam and North Africa. Um, it's like like down to the architecture. So that was something that I also wanted to reflect in, in different, like the different quarters of, um, of El Lost and, um, and the Unbroken. The, uh, the idea of the university being there came from like the oldest, uh, the oldest university in the world is in Morocco, and it was funded by a woman, founded by a woman, and um, and that kind of inspired a little bit um, the 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 university system um, in in the book. If you could write again, the unbroken, which I think you don't want since you've already wrote <laughs> five or six times, is there something you would change? small things like I don't know I might change this here I might change like tweak the ending a little bit I um part of it is just because I I am working on attaching the second book to it and things would be a little easier if I hadn't put this here yet and I hadn't put this here yet um but overall I'm satisfied with um with things as they are I might have mentioned a certain character a little more often um, like kind of like like we talked about with the um, like making sure emotional arcs are consistent. I might have put a little thing here just to remind the reader that she is still sad here, just dealing with other things, just you know stuff like that. You have several secondary characters in the book, and they, you know the, you've given them quite a bit of page space as well. Do you have any favorites amongst the secondary characters? All of them. Um, I think, uh, well, actually, I kind of want to know you guys' favorites. Well, I quite, I, I can't pronounce her name, but um, Turain's partner. Ruth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really like her. I like Prit, uh, but the fire in, it's Thibault? Mm -hmm. The fire in Thibault is just sadly beautiful. Gotta find to hear, on all counts, but... Um, my favorite just depends on who I'm writing again. And, um, so I really love Jagatai. Um, I like that she's just not afraid and like punch the shit out of Tareen. <laughs> Cause she needs it sometimes. Um, and I think she'd love to punch Luca too. I mean, I think she'd, you know, be really into that actually, if it wouldn't cause a diplomatic incident as they call them. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I can't, I could, I could just obviously list them all. I really love Aaron and Joshua as a couple. Um, and I love through it. Oh, if things stay the way they are in the second book, mm, I'm really excited for her story. Are we going so. to get a POV from Pruitt? I'm not going to confirm, but I'm not going to deny. So then I have another question. How hard was it to kill Tibo? Very hard, actually. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, I have thought later, I had an idea, and I wondered if maybe I should have um, killed him later, actually. And that, so that might be something I changed, like just where it happens, um, or how, or who did it, whatever. But, 
um, well, it's done, it's done, it's okay. The, um, but it was, it was difficult. And sometimes I wonder what, uh, what he could have, like what he could have been like as a character who stayed longer. And I don't regret it because it just, it's just a different story. Um, a different kind of story. Yeah. I, I feel like part of, part of, um, the, the subsequent books are, um, terrain trying to find someone who like fills that kind of brotherly space for her um and i mean a lot of other spaces but did you always wanted to be a writer an author or is it some needed or desire that came later in life it was always an option in my head like i'm going to be a writer and Um, but I, I think that had to wait until I actually knew that author is actually a career. Um, I also wanted to be a soccer player on the women's national team. As you can see, I am not at the Olympics right now, so that did not work out. Um, I tried really hard. Um, I also wanted to be an actor. So Hollywood, call me. And... Um, Oh, what else? I'm sure there are other things. When I was really little, I wanted to be a carpenter. I don't know why. I think I just wanted a tool belt. So I should have known I was gay a lot sooner. But um, I wanted a hammer and I wanted a saw. And yeah, I wanted overalls too. It's good to have a tool belt. If I understand correctly, this is your, you've written novellas before, but this is your first full length novel. I actually have not written a novella before. Um, short stories. Short so. stories, sorry, that's what I meant. What's been the difference in the writing journey and in the publication journey between the two? Is it much more complex to write, of that much more complex to write a full-length novel than writing a short story? Is it easier, harder? For me, it is easier in the sense that I can actually just bang out a short story and in one sitting. I mean, it's not necessarily always done. But the fact that I can sit and, and, and encompass from the beginning to the end, the entire thing, where it was with a novel, I can understand the general arc of the entire thing, but I can't fully like think and just like da -da 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 -da, all the way through it. Um, I usually have to have many more iterations of a novel's ideas or just even the scenes. Um, But I do, out, I started outlining short stories as well after I watched a, a talk by Mary Robinette Kowal, who is an um, amazing short story writer um, and, you know, just a cool author and, and teacher. So um, she had this, I was her Patri on her Patreon for a while and she shared her own kind of um, outline, starting and strategy thing. And that helped me actually just conceive of the stories better. And so I was, I started actually started selling more consistently after I like learned that and kind of internalized it a bit. Um, whereas while I think in general, I have a strong idea of how a novel can work. I do. Not, I do not think that I can always just like, Like that, an idea I have will completely be just like a banger, you know. Um, and maybe it's because I can't fully conceive of it until it's all written out. Um, but with a with a short story, I can see the whole thing and I can diagnose very quickly what's wrong with it and how it's going to make a reader feel from like the entire point. Like, but I can't do the same thing with a novel, and I'm usually in much greater need of. Um, support from like beta readers editors and stuff like that um, do you need a specific setting to write are you a pen and paper type of person computer write on a train need silence uh it just depends on the day actually um this is my office my writing office and often i will come in here to write i'm usually more productive in here but just because If I am out on my couch or in my bed, then I am a little bit more likely to get distracted and start playing with, like, people in the house, whatever. Um, but if I don't want to get out of bed, 
I'd rather write in bed than not, not write if I if I have to write for the day. Um, and also, this room is lovely. Um, like you can see all of this light because I have a great big window here, but it's also facing the sun. And so when it's hot, it's hot. Um, so I usually do have to retreat to the bedroom. So just following on from Camille's question, do you make yourself write every day? And secondly, is there music that inspires you to write? I try to write every day right now because I'm on deadline to get book two, a clean book two, to my editor, um, beginning of September. Uh, hi, Brie. <laughs> um, but if it's not, like, if, I, if my brain needs a break, I take a break. I don't, I'm not. I learned, actually, while taking exams. I had a friend, an older friend, like a mentor in med school, and she was like, you know, if you pull an all-nighter, you're more likely to bomb your test than you are to actually pass it. So do you do what you can, go to bed on time, and then, you know. So I took that to heart, and I'm a big proponent of resting when you can. All-nighters, et cetera, should be like the lastest of resort, especially because if you're typing the night before your deadline, like, you know it's going to be a hot mess. Just... <laughs> send it in and be done um, or ask for an extension. Um, as far as music goes, I do. I, it kind of depends on the, I, I go by vibe usually of what I need to, um, what I want to think about. And it, it helps me get in character moods, location moods. Um, right now I have a, like a kind of Spotify radio playlist that started like the seed songs were from the uh, Portrait of a Young Lady on Fire um, soundtrack. And so it's a lot of like Vivaldi and stuff, but then it's changed to other sort of orchestral soundtrack type things. Um, and then I have a, the like current Kazal soundtrack is, um, soundtrack is a playlist called Stargazer, um, which is kind of atmospheric music from around the Arab world and so that's pretty good very good actually um, and I love Ramin Jawadi so sometimes I just want to like get into the vibe of like some good old just fantasy world stuff and so I'll listen to the Game of Thrones soundtrack um, yeah so you've spoke about deadlines and reading a bit uh, is there a part of doing a book that you really enjoy And what's the part of writing a book that you despite? <laughs> In its natural habitat, like outside of publishing and stuff, I don't think there's any part I actually dislike. Or well, dislike maybe, but not, I, I, don't, I don't hate anything of it because it's all fun at different points. Um, like revision is great at the beginning when you have all the ideas And just like drafting, when you run out of the ideas, it sucks. It all sucks. Um, and so you have to go away, refill whatever brain activity thing. Um, I really do enjoy the ideation part of just like brainstorming on a fresh idea. Like, oh, and this can happen and this can happen. I want a character like this and she can have this kind of sword or maybe the world is like this. And um, I really like the story engine deck. I've yelled about it on Twitter quite a lot. But it's just a fun little idea-making machine, um, like a brainstorming card thing. It's like part tarot card, part, um, like, I don't know. It's just really cool. Um, and um, so that part's always really fun. And, I'll, like, I'll, even with The Unbroken and with book two, I'll just, you know, pick up cards just to sort of see what kinds of new ideas can shake up what's stagnant. And so that part's always really fun. Um, finding a really good scene and drafting like like an emotional top point or a, a shift for a character, that's always really fun. Also really fun is like going out and doing something completely unrelated and then being like, oh, I can put that in the book. I can put that in the book. That's perfect. Things I don't like mostly are just like they're publishing related things, to be honest. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's work. It's a business. Um, so... <laughs> It's very hard, for example, like we don't have a title for book two 
yet because none of us can agree yet. So we're just throwing ideas at each other until we figure out what it's going to be, what sticks. Has the pandemic affected your creativity in any way? Um, in the general sense that, like, everybody's a bit burnt out. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I spent actually a lot of, and part of it was probably pandemic stuff. Um, part of it was that I was in the middle of immigrating to the UK, and so that was stressful. Um, and, um, and then having book release and stuff. So I actually, um, like, from March on, I just felt completely just, like, I don't know. I just couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I think I was maybe supposed to sort of be thinking about book three. I didn't. <laughs> it was, I was, I was gone to the world. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's actually, ironically enough, as, as people have probably seen, um, there is talk of plagues and stuff in, in The Unbroken. And so, you know, thinking about how that will continue to play out um, in the narrative, I have even more to go on now. So, you know, like during lockdown, you can't really go a lot. So I don't really, like, I guess I have to stay home. So I could be writing a lot. Um, and I don't have, I don't have children or anything. So there's that. But when I'm in lockdown, I'm, you know, stressed out and terrified and all that kind of stuff. So that puts a damper on the excitable writing aspect. Have, have there been any books that you've read that have actually influenced your writing style? My writing style? Absolutely. Um, as many people know, I am a big Baru Cormorant fan. Um, and while I are, I had written The Unbroken before I read Baru, uh, I really, really love Seth Dickinson's prose style. And um, though, I mean, mine is certainly different from his writing. I, it's, some, it's something that I look to. Like, I, I love his care for language. It inspires me to be equally careful and to to take time with it. And I, I just, you know, I also like language. I like, I like sound and, and, and that kind of attention. Um, and I also really like Joe Abercrombie's, um, his deep character work. He, as far as I know, all of his books are in third person, but the characters' points of view are so tight and so individualized that, it feels like a completely every single person is completely different, sounds completely different, even in the in the actual like non quotation narrative text. It's completely different vibe. You know immediately when you switch, and so I think that's pretty amazing, um, to be honest. And I would like to be a little bit more distinct, but you know, if you could create story for another medium than book. What would it be? Actually, I wanted to be a screenwriter as well at some point. So uh, that's still that's still hopefully in the cards sometime. Um, I also I applied to more than a few um, video game writing jobs. I was actually trying to get uh, over by you, Camille. I was trying to work at Ubisoft um, in, in Montreal. So didn't work out, unfortunately, but. If you guys are hiring, I'm, I'm into it. That's amazing. Is there a particular story, either in TV, video game, or whatever, that you're like, oh, my God, I wish I, I wrote that? Or um, I, I love the Assassin's Creed franchise uh, in general. Like, I love like, the idea of it. I just like assassins in general. Um, I would love to write pirates. And so... I really want to watch Black Sails, but I just, I, I, it's hard for me to consistently just watch a TV show through because, you know, I'm fighting with so many other things. Like, do I want to play video games in my leisure time? Do I want to read this book? And so it's, it's hard for me to get to TV. Um, but I would like, like pirates, assassins, something like that. That would be. I want to ask a little bit about Luca. So, Turin is a soldier. I expected her to be ruthless. But Luca is also ruthless in her own way. She Sometimes she takes these 
actions and you just think, oh goodness, she's not thinking about the ethics. She just wants something and she, you know, she she do it. So, is that how you always envisioned Luca? And were there any particular challenges in writing her character? Yes, and yes, but no. Um, she actually has been in other drafts. She has been more ruthless. Um, so I, 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 I had a hard time trying to figure out where I wanted her to be, like what kind of, what kind of royal she was going to be. I didn't want to. Um, I find that all too often in stories where people want the royal, people want the royal, at least the royal love interest, to be sympathetic in some way. Um, and so the answer is to have them be totally aware of all the bad things and they want to fix it. And I'm like, well, look at the world. How many of the people in charge really, really want to do everything they can to fix it? Or do they only want to do the convenient things to fix it? Um, and so I kind of found this middle ground and she's like, she can see that certainly there are some things that are not ideal. And in fact, if she fixed them, they would also be profitable to her. So absolutely, let's, let's change that. But I think her big problem is like what to do when what is right conflicts with what I want. And she's, she's a royal. She's used to getting what she wants um, and has enjoyed it quite a lot. Like most of us do. We like to get what we want. And, and sacrificing that is hard. Um, I mean, there are people who are not royal and can't sacrifice enough to put a mask on their face. So, you know. Sometimes when people write about royals, they choose the, oh, but they're prisoner in their own way, which, which <laughs> is false, but true in sense of everyone, we are all trained to fit certain expectations, mm -hmm. even if the expectations are way less mm -hmm. or less serious was that a concern when you wrote Luca like what was she, did she want and what she was willing to lose mm -hmm. and how she was maybe still trapped in some protocol because not following it would be worst in general or did you just go F it up? <laughs> um I do not enjoy that trope. Um, part of it goes a little bit with um, the, the other idea of like accepting your position in society and, and just owning the fact that sometimes you want things that are not at the benefit of other people. And, but I think I also just wanted, uh, I wanted to write a royal who wanted power. Cause I, I, you know, I also, I don't know, there's this whole, the like idea of the noble ruler who doesn't want power but will accept it for the greater good. I'm like, no, man. That's not who's in charge. That's not who's in charge. Um, and I mean, she might have idealistic reasons for wanting it, um, especially as time passes, but she wants to rule because she thinks it's her right and she doesn't want somebody else to do it. Um, I think this was this was actually something also that I think was really handled well in um, uh, Marie Rukowski's The Midnight Lie, I think is it's called. Um, but there's a royal character or a noble character. Sorry, spoilers. It's really good, but read it. Um, um, but there's a there's a royal character who has run away, and she's like, "But I want to be free." And the girl that she's hanging out with is like. She comes from the poor district of this other country, and she's like, you dumbass. Like, what are you, like, you already are free. You've got enough money to do whatever you want in a whole different country. Like, you were just pretending being in jail. What are you talking about? Like, there are consequences for your behavior, but even those are minor. So... Have you ever thought one day of maybe going back and writing a story of a younger Turin or a younger Luca? I I had a uh, like a sort of early chapter that was actually like little Turin um, in the little like in the little kid barracks. Um, it ended up getting cut. It was kind of like a I don't know, more of a writing exercise. I think it didn't end up fitting 
But the actual prequel I wanted to write, and who knows, maybe Orbit will buy one. Um, I actually wanted to write the uh, the old guard. Um, so um, Jasha and Aranin and Jagatai when they were younger, um, but also Jagatai's beef with Kantik. I wanted to watch them um, duke it out earlier on and kind of how Jasha found the other side of Shaolin magic and then like what happened after when she, 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 like I know all of, all of their little backstories and stuff. Like Arnon was supposed to be married to somebody else. Um, I know it was like, it was very scandalous. Um, but then he was going off to be like a magistrate for the Baladarans who were in the city. And, and then like Joshua came back just in time and she was like, what is this? Um, it was, it's all very, very, um, involved, very scandalous, but. Um, your, the audiobook of Unbroken has been narrated by Rasha Zamiri. Have Zamiri. you listened to it and has it changed your perception of any of the characters? I have not listened to it in its entirety. I actually should ask for that, like that link or something. Um, but I have listened to it. I listened to her. I actually got to... Um, choose her out of a kind of like an audition of a few narrators. Um, and so I really like the parts that I've heard of her reading. Um, I really like it a lot. Uh, what I do like is being able to work with these other artists to collaborate a little bit more on the finished and future projects. Like um, working with Tommy Arnold, I got his image of terrain on the cover before um, I finished copy edit, so I was actually able to go in and make a few changes here, like, okay, well, he's got these two pillars set like this, so let me make the pillars in the temple look just like that, and let me add a description of the the color of her scarf and stuff to match. Um, so. How fabulous is that cover, though? <laughs> oh, man, it's the best thing yeah. ever. Uh, Do you get him for the so next lucky. two books as well? Um, I, we've sent the brief already for book two. Um, and he has confirmed. He's like, I'm really mm. excited to work on book two. So I have an, like I have some, he's got the direction from the art director. And so I'm uh, very excited. Um, that coupled with like trying to coordinate, I don't know how serious they are about it, the art directors, but to have a, the second books of the saffron trifecta we know what uh tasha series book two colors are so we're kind of like can we match it oh right okay kind of work. Yeah. the jasmine throne was really lovely as well as yeah, mm-hmm. as a book. yeah i, I really love that book it, yeah so and i also really love she who became the sun so readers go check it out so when you're designing a book cover as an author what input do you need to give and how much say do you have in the final design I actually didn't need to give that much input um, on the first one because my editor and I were on the same page. He's like, this is what I envision, kind of taking the the power stance or like power seat trope of male fantasy characters and put it on to Ray. And I was like, yes, I want it. And so that was the end of that. I didn't think about colors or anything like that. Um, And then for book two, having seen kind of what, first off, just like what Tommy Arnold could do. Um, but having an idea for the vibe that I want a certain person to look like on the cover um, of book two, like, you know, I want kind of matching um, matching powers. Like, I don't, I don't want one to feel different um, than the other. Um, so I had some ideas for that. And um, Lauren Panepinto... Um, and my editor, Brie, they liked it. So uh, we'll see what happens. Can we get a, a good glimpse, or a good look on your tattoo? I'm just like... <laughs> which, uh, which one? Um, so the lower one here, I will see if I can. Uh, this is my uh, waterfall tattoo. I don't know if you can Very nice. see that. Um, and then my Kansas one is a... Uh, compass with uh, some wheat, um, some arrows, um, and the Kansas State motto, which is at Astra, for Astra. Very nice. Just try 
<laughs> all the time because it's like ah! <laughs> yep yep i'm into it a lot beautiful Thank you. very beautiful do you have any advice for new writers um one is very cliche but you should read a lot but um on a more tactical level in terms of the business side if that's something that folks are interested in um don't rush be patient don't expect anything and the last one is like you know it's hard like i think everyone should expect like basic dignity and stuff but you may not find it in publishing to be quite honest um you should fight for it um and you should not accept less than that but do not expect it from all quarters if something less than like you know what you deserve comes at you like it there's a good chance it's going to happen and you know maybe it's because your novel's not great yet maybe it's because that person is racist or sexist or who knows what but there's a good chance you will get something that you do not want to hear and in certain cases it's something to fight not fight but not fight so that you work with that person i guess that's what i'm trying to say is when you get it take it not as a sign of your own worth but as a sign of how to navigate or who to navigate around um yeah so like if an agent has a really weird obnoxious submissions policy don't be mad at them just don't work with them like you can and tell your friend not to work with them like that's fine um because you know sometimes that's shit's obnoxious sometimes it's ableist sometimes they're just like actual bad actors um i guess so don't be surprised and you know we're human so we will be heard by things but um unless it's something that like really needs to be called out which is sometimes the case for sure with folks in publishing um but if it's not like an egregious thing you kind of have to just like draw your lines your boundaries um and you know we all got to get used to rejection in in the in the normal ways so we're in the this or that section of the video this or that cats or dogs at french or english literature french russian <laughs> black or white black salt or pepper salt sugar or spice 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 hot or cold hot yes hot socks or blankets oh ah uh, blankets summer or winter winter mountain or river <laughs> river vanilla or chocolate vanilla bar or restaurant restaurant Cinema or theater? Theater. Family, friends or lover? Lover. <laughs> US or UK? Uh space. <laughs> UK. One. <laughs> UK will say UK. <laughs> And that's it. Cool. <laughs> What I really like though, the part I struggle the most is I really like rivers on mountains like i love mountain rivers a lot so that's actually what uh, my tattoo is oh cool thank you very much uh, for your time it was uh, very nice at least for me yes, <laughs> that's great that's great so glad. Thank, thank you guys for having me you do you have any parting words for your readers thank you honestly just thank you <laughs> um i think that it's very hard to get queer books but most especially um lesbian books, sapphic books to be taken seriously as a market force and I I honestly think that um getting in the ninth like support for getting in the ninth kind of showed publishers like oh this is actually a very big market and so um honestly I just think all of the readers and and you know artists and reviewers um and booksellers who are like like all of you guys for for showing up and and being loud about it and excited about it and telling people about it because without you guys I I mean I might have a few sales and that would be like the end of my career until I 
I don't know, switch to writing, you know, straighter fantasy or something. So you guys are amazing.